my name is Mary, and I'm a product manager working at Algolia. For those that don't know Algolia, we are a search as a service company, meaning that we want our customers to have the best search and discovery experience. To give you an example, if you're an e-commerce company and you, have, like, uh, you want your users to search and browse your products, you can use us. Uh, I'm here to talk to you about how investing in developer experience can actually help you empower developers to build great user experience. Developers' experience at Algolia has always been something we were really into, even before I joined the company uh, more than three years ago now. But um, today, yes, today it reached a stage where not only we care about the developer experience we provide with our uh, REST API, for instance, we also added like four different teams working on all the toolings on top of them, meaning the backend SDKs that helps you push the data to us, or uh, the front-end um, libraries so that you can build the search experience themselves, and the technical documentation. Algolia is, um, has a search engine that is closed source, but all the libraries are open sourced, and you will see later why actually this is a great idea to uh, open source uh, tools. So, what is developer experience and why it matters? Well, developers are users like any other kind, and they are experiencing some kind of journeys along their implementation time. Uh, it all starts with a problem they are trying to solve. At that stage, what matters for them is to know if they want, or if they could, use a tool or a product that will uh, solve their problem, or if they have to build something themselves. Uh, let's say they discover you. They arrive on your website, and what matters at that stage is that they can sign up, quickly get access to some API keys, and so they could start. Uh, when they start, what they want to evaluate is that your tools or your products will actually answer their needs. And if they found that it is, then they're going to end up in this loop where they will have questions such as, how can I achieve this or that or this, until they're done. Now, hopefully, if all that journey was successful and was pleasant for them, maybe they can become an advocate of your product toward the developer's community. And in our case, because the tools are open source, they can become potential contributor. Now, if we take a bit of a step back and we look at two different personas on a project, on one side, you have the business. Uh, usually what business people want is uh, to delight their users, providing them the best user experience. And if they can have this in the fastest possible ways, it's even better. Now, on the developer side, uh, the people that are actually going to implement uh, those features, uh, what matters for them is that the tool they are using uh, make them efficient and integrate nicely in their own ecosystem. If you look at the crossroad between those two personas, uh, actually in between, it's where developer experience uh, comes in place. <coughs> in place. So, I wanted to share what I think are the four great pillars of building a, a very good developer experience. It all starts with key enablers. So the specifics of, of those enablers will probably depend on your products, but there's like some key theme uh, within them. Uh, if you want developers to focus on what matters, meaning the user's experience they're going to provide, the very first thing you might want to do is to provide out-of-the-box performances. Uh, we all experienced interfaces that were long to uh, like, um, answer, like those infinite spinner, etc. It's not very pleasant, so you want to make sure that uh, the performances of what you are providing are great. You also want to provide a service that is reliable. If you um, build the best experience ever, but the service, one of the services you're using is not working, uh, it's pointless. Reliability is not just a matter of like, providing the best infrastructure, um, it's also uh, stuff like thinking about what is a good retry strategy, things like that, and this is, can be hard to build, can be hard to think about, so uh, that's a territory when you want to help developers um, 
uh, here. And last but not least, you want to make sure that developers understand your domain specifics. If uh, I take our example, search, traditionally search is a back-end engineering domain, meaning it's back-end engineers that are like, traditionally working on those kind of things, and it can be very hard to understand uh, what makes a good search, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Us, from the very beginning, if we were like, okay, we want customers to have the best search and discovery experience, it means that we want to empower front-end developers to build search interface, and therefore, they need to understand what makes a great search experience. You want to give them quickly uh, the knowledge of knowing how they can achieve great relevance of the search results, or like some tips about the display um, of the search, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. It actually led me to my second uh, pillars, tooling. Because tooling is the way where you can actually provide that uh, very easily for the developers. So, yes, we offer a REST API, but what we say to all our developers is that you should use the SDKs. You have SDKs for every backend stuff, like pushing the data, and you have SDKs that we call UI libraries uh, to actually build your front end. They have different purposes. There's like one need, one tool. If I deep dive into the UI libraries, because I'm here to talk about UX, uh, we decided to provide a set uh, of open source libraries. Our goals behind those libraries was to hide the search complexity and to provide best practices and good design out of the box. By that, I mean we provide widgets. Uh, so widgets are great, but most likely people, developers, they would want to go behind. They would want to customize the colors, or they would even want to change completely the UI. So we wanted to make them highly customizable. Also, because we know developers, some of them, they want to go further. Maybe they want to do something that we didn't think about. So we wanted to make sure that those widgets, they were all relying on lower abstraction that we gave access to, so that developers that want to go further, they can use those abstraction and maybe build stuff we never think uh, about. Finally, we decided to match the various front-end ecosystem uh, that exist uh, today, so not all, but some of them. Uh, for the ones that are familiar with front-end development, it's a wild stage. There's many, many different frameworks that exist. And today, if you're a developer that works with vanilla JavaScript, uh, you're most likely going to expect very different APIs, very different patterns than the ones that are using React, for instance. And for us, it was like a, a very important thing that those different type of developers would find the tools that help them uh, achieve what they want in the best possible ways. Um, to give you a more like concrete example of what those UI libraries bring to developers, let's say you want to implement search on your website. And at some point, you will think of something like, I want to add a brand menu on my website because I want my users to be able to filter by brand. Without our UI libraries, our answer would have been something like, sure, just use the client, then use the helper, and then add a disjunctive facet. Now, with the UI libraries, what we can answer to those developers is like, sure, just use the menu widgets. And most likely, we would not answer anything because there will not be any question before because it's kind of obvious. My next pillar is documentation because you can provide the best tool ever. You can have, like, I don't know, in the code, the best comments. Uh, if you don't have a proper technical documentation to guide developers toward the, impl the implementation, it's, uh, you're missing something. So documentation is uh, like a big topic. There's conferences dedicated to know how you should uh, write technical documentation. But um, here I wanted to share some tips of uh, what we discovered building our own. The first thing that works pretty well is to provide concrete examples. So there's the obvious one, like code samples, like things when a developer arrives on a guide or on an API reference, they can quickly copy-paste some, copy some code. 
and, uh, and it works. And I would say if you do that, you should always think of providing code that works out of the box, meaning they copy past it and they don't, as they don't have to modify anything. But there's other type of example that exist as well. Uh, for instance, we decided not so long ago to create that page called Widget Showcase. And today it's one of the most uh, seen pages on our technical documentation, where the goal was to display all the widgets we offer uh, in the different kind of search pattern that exist. And we did it in an interactive way, meaning if you go on that page, uh, you can actually play with the widget and you can see the goal of those widgets. And if you want to use them, you can go to the API reference uh, afterwards. Also, you should make sure that you provide a logical path uh, so that developers can progress from beginners to uh, advanced users. When someone starts with your product, they don't know anything about it. What matters at that moment is that they found the page explaining them how they can quickly get started. And if they can, uh, with that page, have a very good overview of what you provide, it's good because it makes them understand the value proposition behind your product. Now, once they read the moment when they are, okay, I'm going to use your product, what you want is to guide them toward all the different features you, uh, you give access uh, to in what I say, the logical ways, like in a way that, ma that makes sense uh, for, for them to, to, to get everything. It sounds easy, but actually, it has a, some, a bit of thought behind the different order of the pages, etc. Finally, you should, make sure you, you should make sure that you provide various type of contents. We all learn in a very different ways. Some people prefer to read text, others prefer to watch videos, and others need to have their hands dirty and play with some code straight away. Uh, we didn't want to match only one type of person here. We wanted to embrace uh, them all, so we decided to basically match all those kind of learning ways. The last pillar I would have for you is communication, and it's basically the glue behind all uh, of the previous one, because developers are users like any other kind of users, and the very first thing you want to uh, um, do about them is to learn who they are, how they think, what they need. And the best way for, for that is to put your own developers in front of their users. So at Algolia, everybody, every engineer on every team does support. It's even true today, while actually we do have a dedicated support team, but everybody keeps doing support. And for the teams that are in charge of all the toolings, because they are open source, Everybody can actually wrote an issue or open a uh, feature request on GitHub, and they are always in contact with all those uh, uh, developers. So they got a chance to really know what works, what does not, etc. What you want to also build is a community, meaning if someone at some point has a question because they don't know how to do something, you will probably answer them. If that knowledge, uh, you put it online, uh, either, for instance, for us, it's like on a community forum or also uh, through Stack Overflow, no matter the place, if someone that has the same question, Google it, find that place where you did already answer, then it's a win because they will probably not go into your support and it will save us a bit of time. Finally, you want to make sure you nurture a relationship with the developers, and in a sense, you want to make sure you communicate them often the changes you are doing to your products, to your libraries, etc. So, for instance, providing clear change log with everything that is new, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, investing in Dix is great, and I would really like encourage you to do so. But there's some stuff I wanted uh, to uh, warn you about. The first thing is that there's not a unique type of developer. It's very easy, especially uh, when you're working on developer uh, products or tools, um, because people working on those products are developers themselves, uh, it's very easy for them to think that they know everything. Yes, I'm a developer. I know how everybody thinks as a developer, so I know that we should do that. Uh, no, everybody uh, is different. There's different kind of pattern, etc. The best way of overcoming that bias is to build diversified team. 
uh, making sure that in you know, your engineering teams uh, there's people coming from various backgrounds, various cultures, etc., just so that you don't have this bias of a unique type of developer. Also, you should um, have and you should define a coherent strategy. When we are starting building all those toolings, uh, basically we, we are popping up uh, a lot of tools here, like uh, SDK in Go, SDK in Java, and then we have the libraries in React, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, because we were not that many developers at the time, everything was like uh, the documentation was spread a bit everywhere. Some were having readmes in, on GitHub, some were having a dedicated doc, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. As a result, we were confusing our users. Developers coming to the to Algolia were like, "Okay, what should I use?" So really, you should think of uh, having a clear again path about what. The, which tool you should use for which problem, and you should probably use your like, general documentation to guide a developer toward the discovery of those tools. Also, investing in developer experience as a cost. And you should be aware of that, because when you are shipping a tool, it's not a one-time thing. Hopefully, your product will live, and you will have new features to integrate to those tools. And if you have different variations of the same tool, uh, it means that you have to put those new features uh, in very different places, and you also have the maintenance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it has a cost. And for that, you should be careful about your velocity. Uh, again, uh, when I joined Algolia, we were not that much. Then we grew a lot. We added more people to work on those different tools, and as a result, we were. Um, um, uh, less um, productive, like we were shipping less um, often than before, which sounds counterproductive. And one of the reasons of that is because at some point, you want to optimize a bit more how the code is structured, you want to reuse more uh, things you uh, build in, and so this, you, you, should, you should have it in mind because you don't want to over-optimize at the very beginning when you are starting, when you're iterating, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But you don't want to wait too much because if you do, then you will have to uh, catch up and do those refactoring that can be a bit painful. Ownership is key until you need more structure. Uh, what I mean by this is, again, at the very beginning of Algolia, it was one developer, one library. We had experts in Java that will work on the Java SDK. We had an expert in Go that will work on the Go SDK, et cetera, et cetera. At that time, there were no PM, there were no uh, developer, strategy, uh, developer experience strategy as a whole. So basically, one developer was acting as a mini PM for their own libraries. Um, at some point, we grew, and we wanted to bring a bit more like, coherence. So we added teams, and then teams need to be structured, needs to find the way they are working together. And this does not happen overnight. Switching from a model where it's like ownership to a model of, okay, now it's a team owning different uh, tool, uh, it, it takes a bit of time, and you need to anticipate this. And finally, maybe my favorite, <laughs> my favorite one, uh, consistency is an everyday battle. What I mean by consistency is, for instance, the method names, the default behavior uh, in all your tooling. Uh, for instance, on different variations, they were not the same. So consistency advocate in a team might sound a bit boring because consistency is not a very pleasant topic, but it's very important. Um, I was hearing at, uh, like a few months or years ago now, that it was okay if, it, if the libraries were not consistent, because someone using the React version uh, will probably not use the vanilla JS version. And it's true. Uh, if your website is in like, React, probably you will not use the vanilla version. But the thing is, like, our customers, developers, were not the only user of those tools. We at least had two other user, kind of users. The first category of other users were what we called customer-facing teams. So it's our teams that are working with our customers to help them implement us, or doing POC, et cetera, et cetera. Those persons, they, they don't choose which libraries they are going to use because they are like, taking the one the customer actually um, uh, are using. And so at some point, they were like, I don't understand. Like In this one, is that name, in this one, and that name, it was hell for them. 
Another kind of user uh, that exists is the team itself. Because at the beginning of, uh, of the journey with all those libraries, the people that were there, they knew everything. They knew why the, this choice was made, uh, why it was this and this and this, but those people, they left. They left because uh, they joined another team uh, later in the company, or they left the company, and, and basically they um, left without knowledge. So really, you want to make sure that you have consistency in mind. If you have this SG routine to check, it's way, way more easier than waiting for like the big like, uh, pile of, uh, um, I will not say the word, but like, uh, yeah, just have it in mind, think about it regularly, it's less painful than if you wait uh, too long. So, just to conclude and to wrap up, basically, what matters is that developers are focusing on the right thing. And for us, what we really want is for them to focus on reinventing what is search and discovery and to innovate on that territory. And so it very, it's very important that they have time to focus on that instead of focusing on your uh, issue with API errors and stuff like that. That's it. Thank you.